From Philadelphia, it's time for America's favorite dance party, American Bandstand. Welcome to the Old Timers Party. And well, Bandstand probably was the first reality show. You know, and, and, and before MTV and, and the reality shows, it was like a soap opera. Everybody wanted to know who's dating this person, who's going with that person. It was just innocent times. It was, it was just simple. It was a school activity, when you think about it. Some kids played football. Some kids were uh, in dramatic club. You know, they, everybody had an activity after school. That was our activity. <laughs> In the beginning, I was going every day, every day. I always, that last class, I made sure I just hid in the back and would be set in my hair. <laughs> my girlfriends were hysterical. We would cut classes. We had like eight or nine classes, and we would leave like the sixth class. Father would say, where are you going? Well, you know where we're going, Father, because the priest watched the show. I mean, everybody watched the show. Even if you cut school, they watched the show. You know, we would go to the show, start dancing at 2.30, the way it worked, it was like 2.30 to 3, it was local. And then it went semi-national, because it was syndicated at 3 to 4. And then from 4 to 5, it was California. It, it was a phenomenon that we didn't even realize uh, how popular the show was. And I remember, I think, the first week, uh, the post office could not handle all the fan mail that came in on American Bandstand. Special guest stars leading off with Bobby Helms and Jacqueline. Jacqueline, I'm so in love with you, my Jacqueline would come out earlier and, you know, give us a little talk and enjoy yourselves. We're here to have fun. And it was a little nervous because I was shy. I was only 13 and a half, actually. Well, you can talk about your Julie and your Peggy Sue. You can keep your Miss Molly and your Mary Lou. And there was this cop at the door and I, he said, are you 14? I went, yeah, yeah, I'm 14. <laughs> and he said, okay. And I got in, and that was it. I got involved uh, through high school. A good buddy of mine, Jerry Blavitt, the Geeter. And what do you do, sir? Geeter with the heater. <laughs> uh, Jerry and I went to school together, uh, and he said, Frank, come up one day. That was prior to Dick Clark taking the show. It was Bob Horn's Bandstand, and it was the most popular show in Philadelphia. When Bob Horn lost the show, Dick Clark was taking over, and we didn't want Dick Clark to take the show over. We protested. We had the flags and the, the whole thing. We were, we were going to go in, and it's an hour before the show starting, and Dick Clark was so nervous because we weren't walking in. And all of a sudden, the police came. The WFIL, which was the local station, uh, called the police. So the police were coming, and I said to Jerry, you know what, I'm going in to dance because I'm not going to get arrested. So long story short on that, and Joey, Jerry always jokes about it, is the fact that he didn't go in, he got arrested, and all of us walked in, and we danced. It was pretty much what you saw on TV. The stands, the music would come on, we would dance, he was up on the podium. And the exciting part is when, you know, we met everyone, all stars in those, in those in the, during that era. You know, even movie stars came and all the rock and roll stars we met and became friendly with. And, and then you have uh, Frankie Avalon, uh, who I adored at the time. I had such a crush. I was invited to his 18th birthday party. And that was a thrill for me. So I was in the men's room downstairs. And who walks in that day, the guest stars, not knowing who they were, Pat Boone, Bobby Darren, and Sal Minio. So when they would come to the show, we would go crazy. 
You know, we'd clap. You know, every time somebody come that we'd really liked, we really made a noise. We really made a lot of noise for them. In a while, we'll leave it off with Frankie Avalon and Dee Dee Dina. <laughs> So the first day I went in and I watched and I danced with one girl. The second day, she picked me out of the crowd. I guess it was my lucky day. <laughs> I, was, I was there before Kenny was and I wasn't uh, the prettiest girl in the show. I wasn't a fashion plate or anything like that. And for some reason I started to get mail and Dick Clark started to talk to me on the show. But I didn't have a dance partner at the time. I was a very homely kid and quiet and shy. She was. Until I saw him in, this, in the stands and I needed a dance partner. So I looked up in the stands and I saw him sitting there and he reminded me so much of myself. And I asked him to dance with me, which is <laughs> unheard true. of in those days. Yes, yeah, true. But I did get a little brazen, you know. I was scared to death. And it really clicked. And we started dancing together, and, <laughs> and it, then we were the couple. What was the year that you and he won this contest? Uh, 1958. Was a couple of funny little automobiles, wasn't it? Or yeah. weird, kooky little Three things? Wheels. Three wheels, yeah. This editor approached us, and there was no such thing as 16 Magazine. And she, her idea was to use us as the, the foundation for the magazine, and it blew just she, blew up, it went, went crazy. Since we went to New York one day and passed it and, and, went, and wanted to see the little theater at, on our own, and that was the big mistake. Oh boy. They saw us <clears throat> and they, they ran after him. They were, half the crowd ran after him and half the crowd ran after me. They were trying to take my, my sweater, my, my clothes. And they, they got my clothes. This woman saved me, <clears throat> took me into the Hotel Astor, we went through the hotel Austin, and then we were looking for him. They got, <coughs> and Excuse then when me. we found him, in the, she took me in a cab, and we were looking for him. And they had his belt and everything. <laughs> and he was sweating. I mean, they really did a number. We went to New York. Dick Clark uh, had a bus for us, whole bus load. We all went. And getting off that bus, they had a cops on each side. It was like thousands of people, I thought, at the time roped off, screaming as we, you know, exited the bus. So it, it was, it was fun. And I went, wow. <laughs> I didn't have a boyfriend on bandstand. Uh, I had a, a boy crush on someone in my neighborhood that I grew up with, and his name was Bobby Ritterelli, who is Bobby Rydell. And he was my first boy crush. And we hung out as just friends, and then I was graduating and I wanted to ask him to my prom. <laughs> well, I was the most nervous person in the world at that time to call up somebody to ask them to a prom. I was so nervous, I was shy, and I, I was afraid that I might be rejected, and who knew? And it took me, I think, about three weeks totally talking about this with my friends and trying to get myself to call them up. Make a long story short, after I called them up, and I just went real quick, Bobby, it's Carol, hi, would you go to the prom with me? <laughs> Just boom, boom, boom. And it was such a release just came over my whole body. He just went, oh, sure. I was like, whoa. So from that, we went and we had a great time and we started dating. About a year later is when he made his first recording. Kansas City team. Within a three-four block neighborhood, 
It was Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rydell, Fabian, James Darren. It, just, it was just, just a pocket neighborhood. And Bob Mar Marcucci, who was the manager of, of uh, Frankie Avalon and then Fabian, uh, he was local. He was getting, you know, there was a lot of nice looking guys on the in the neighborhood. And so he was just picking out guys that, that, that he thought would be good. And he started with Frankie, of course, because Frankie was in showbiz with it as a trumpet player. Don't want to be a teacher's pet. Oh, no. A teacher's pet won't do. Teacher's pet won't do. Just want to get close as I can get. Pretty baby, you. Pretty baby, you. I went to Frankie's house, and I remember saying, wow, this is what happens when you become a star, you know. Yeah. He, had, he had a Cadillac, I think, and <laughs> he lived in South Philly and it was before he moved. You know. Well, Bobby lived two blocks away. Fabe lived right around the corner from me. And Bobby I knew very well because um, our grandparents had houses in Walwood and Montgomery Avenue, right next door to each other. And Bobby and I would do funny stories when we were kids, like we're pretending we were pirates and things like that. And then imitations, that's how Bobby started, uh, was with imitations, Frankie Fonte, Jerry Lewis, and so forth. And his dad would take us around to local clubs to do these things, we'd get like five or six dollars and all that. So I knew Bobby way back then. Fabe I knew because he grew up in the neighborhood. Fabe was two years younger than me. And what we used to have locally, one street would play against another street, football. It was, he was 11th Street and I was Warnock Street and we'd play. And they, those guys all had uniforms, we didn't have uniforms. Fabian, he wasn't a star yet. And my girlfriend Carol, <laughs> she said to me, I want, oh this boy in, in school, he's so cute, he's so cute, you gotta meet him, you gotta meet him. I said, okay. I said, what's his name? She said, Fabian. I said, Fabian? What kind of name is Fabian? <laughs> you know, she said, oh, you love him, you love him. So she called him up on the phone, and we were, on, we, went, we were in South Philadelphia, and he came out and he met us on the corner, and I just like flipped out. I never saw such a beauty. Oh, my God. He was gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. That's good. And sweet. <laughs> and nice. That's but very you, nice. No, it's before, <laughs> no, it's before, it's before uh, I even knew you. Uh, uh, this happened. Before I even knew you. Well, But, we, I mean, it, it, it was sweet. It was just, we just met. How could you that know? be? Oh, oh, it was. Uh, it's before he became uh, famous. <laughs> I remember uh, even Fabe wanted to go out with one of the girls on bandstand, which I fixed him up with and we went on a double date, you know, so that was kind of fun. There's a lot more I don't have time to show it on to you. But ladies, thank you very much. This is something we'll treasure for a long, long time. Let's go now to Jody Reynolds with Endless Sleep. Today, if they had that show and watched the way these kids were and how they looked and how they dressed, they'd be counting their blessings if their kids went to a show like that. And, you know, because, you know, it was just innocent times. It was, it was just simple times, you know, and uh, it was a good place to be. Our parents knew where we were. <laughs> they, knew it, they knew exactly where we were and what we were doing. Our time went quickly today. We had a lot of fun. I hope you did. If you possibly have a chance, if you can arrange it in your schedule, if you're not going to be too busy, why don't we make it a date again for tomorrow? Our thanks again to Joey D and the Starlighters for joining us. Have a real nice evening for tonight. Dick Clark. Good night. Debut now for American Newsstand. It follows.